Good morning, everyone. How is everyone doing today? Hey, uh, <clears throat> hey, David, can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, fantastic. Hey, David, can you uh, can you split screen us just for a second so that I can see Vicky? Yes, let me let me get that. Let me get that shot of Vicky. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. And good morning, everyone. As you can see, I'm at work. Um, they just keep making me work. I don't know what's going on, but uh, we've been uh, we've been really busy and just a lot of very high acuity patients here lately. So um, as soon as I can see Vicky, I want y'all to see the look on her face when I tell her this. Oh, uh, but anyway, welcome here we, here to we go. Uh, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. There we go. So there you go. So did you see? Oh, you know, it's the good news. Did you see your present this morning? I did. I did. Yes. I already had Was that it. a good present? It Was is. that a good That's present? Perfect. We'll be able to uh, finish the course. Yes, absolutely. So I was able to get Vicky a uh, a, a balloon catheter in in it completely intact uh, that expired. As a matter of fact, when I went and asked that day, and uh, they were just getting ready to uh, to toss it, so I got really lucky and was able to get a hold of that. So thanks for that. Anyway, um, hey David, if you you mind like this I kind of like it and I'll do my opening remarks like this um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we can. perfect okay so to reach out to us here's how you do that contact us at perfusioneducation.com I can't see anything there it is oh yeah great okay so that's how you reach out to us you want to send us a message suggest the topic uh, you know, send some compliments, any complaints, you send it to Vicki Carlisle, uh, <laughs> personally, not to, not to me. And then, uh, here's our call in number, which, uh, is 832. For those of you just listening, 832-239-5358. And, uh, that's 832-239-5358. So if you'd like to call, be live on the air, we'd love to hear from you and ask some questions, uh, or make some comments, whatever the case may be. And then here you see our scroll bar down below right there. That scroll bar is on during the entire time and it talks about uh, how you reach us on Facebook and X and uh, YouTube. Make sure you like and subscribe. Those are very important things or share or whatever that thing is. And then we have uh, the, uh, the, the, the liked in or LinkedIn or whatever it's called uh, thing as well. So uh, please make sure you like and subscribe. Give us a thumbs up. It really matters to us. And we just appreciate so much you putting you your, your CEU needs uh, in us. And hopefully we're bringing you some really interesting content that is uh, you'll find germane to your uh, particular practice and will we'll help us all be better. Uh, if you'd also like to be a, a, a faculty member, you have an expertise in something or would like to share a, a really interesting case that you think would be instructive, please let us know. We would love for you to do that, okay? Uh, and then, of course, we have our Critical Care Perfusion app. I'm getting ready to use that actually today. And I'm going to show you right here. I went ahead and opened it up already, but uh, I have the uh, patient. I could put the patient's age in. It's very easy to do. Uh, I put in the patient's pre-pump hematocrit, uh, put in their height in centimeters, put in their weight in kilograms. It's just this easy. Pump prime is going to be 700. Anesthesia volume is always too much, so I'm just going to put a liter because that's pretty common for them. Pre-pump urine, I don't quite know that yet, but I would put in, I'm just going to put 200 cc's for now. We do 300 units per kilo. Calculate, I get my BSA, my BMI, my estimated blood volume, red cell volume, heparin dose. Uh, I get the uh, estimated on-pump hematocrit, and then here are all my flows right here. So it is a very intuitive, very easy to use app with a lot of information, and it's got a whole bunch of different features in it. So I'd really appreciate you guys taking a look at that. I think you would find it quite useful. There it is again. And then, of course, you know we have our podcasts. You can listen to us, whatever your favorite podcast streaming software may be, you can just go on there and uh, and listen to all of these programs. And it's become actually pretty popular. I think podcasts are just you know, basically the way to go. People listen 
And uh, of course, if we have diagrams on graphs and we're drawing and stuff, it's sort of hard to really appreciate that unless you're actually watching. But, uh, but I think the content still in the dialogue is quite, uh, quite useful. Okay, and then next on the agenda is our adult ECMO specialist training course. And this was really more, I think, originally conceived for nurse uh, uh, ECMO specialists uh, because I feel like, you know, that is the direction a lot of this is going. Um, there simply will never be enough perfusionists given the, what I think is, is incredible growth of ECMO utilization. There's just are not going to be enough perfusionists to manage it. Uh, and do clinical cases. And I don't see us, because ECMO can be so inconsistent. It could be a lot and then it could be a little, it could be none, it could be a moderate amount, and you just never know from day to day what your actual volume is going to be unless you're in a single center. If you're covering multiple hospitals, then of course it becomes really challenging. But even a single center is, uh, is challenging. But anyway, I do think the content is incredibly useful for perfusionists. Um, I did not get this uh, uh, approved for Category 1 CEU through the ABCP, but I certainly can do it. And I would ask everyone who's watching this program to please go on mediweb.us, click on the Adult ECMO Specialist Training Course. You will be able to look at what the course objectives are. You'll actually be able to see all of the different lectures that come in the course. And there's a multitude of different disciplines and people that give the lectures. So please take a look at it. And if you would be so kind as to either make a comment in the program today or send an email uh, to us, uh, letting us know whether you see this as something that the uh, uh, perfusion uh, professional would find useful. Now, the way it works is the didactic portion is done online with two-way live communication with the faculty and the panel and then you have to travel to Houston to do the simulation course, the uh, portion of the hands-on portion of it. It's a four-day course, two days didactic, two days of simulation. Um, if you took everything combined, it would be probably 40 credits by the ABCP, plus or minus, uh, if they approved everything. If you only did the didactic portion of it, it'd be about 20.4 credits. So take a look at that, and if you see it's something viable, that's something you would want to do, then I'll go through the process of getting it accredited through the ABCP. Okay, so we all know Vicki Carlisle. Vicki Carlisle has been, let me get back in the center, I'm sorry. I know I'm moving around a little bit. Um, normally I'm sitting and I'm not as, you know, on my feet. When I get on my feet, I can't hold still. I apologize for that. Um, but Vicki Carlisle is uh, an incredible, incredible educator. She, uh, she grossly estimates her, her, her uh, uh, I think, online persona and her effectiveness in educational technique. Um, I've always enjoyed listening to her. I think she gets into some very interesting detail. And today's lecture specifically is going to be about uh, hemodynamic waveform analyses. Now, one of the things that I did wrong is I scheduled it. Did I do something wrong? Was that wrong? Yeah, that, that's the second part. If we have time, I was going to get to the waveform analysis, but it's going to be pretty heavy lecture. The, the, the bulk of it is going to be hemodynamic disturbances. Oh, that's uh, right. That's right. Yeah, you yeah, missed. That, that's right. The one that but you missed I, the other day. If we have day. time, I do, I do would like to get through the waveform analysis as well. But it's going to be okay. Heavy. Very good. Okay, so hemodynamic disturbances. I'm sorry, I was reading on what it what it was scheduled as, so yeah. I apologize. Yeah, I got the other up. thing that that's okay. Well, <laughs> well, we're we're in good company then. Um, I appreciate that. So uh, the other thing that I did wrong, folks, is I scheduled it for only an hour, and it's going to take longer than an hour. So um, it is only approved for the one hour of CEU, but I do hope that everyone will spend the entirety of the time and really learn from who is truly an expert on hemodynamic disturbances, how we manage them, and also the uh, waveform analyses. So it's really, I, I think you're gonna truly enjoy this. And uh, the last thing I needed to mention was, uh, there was something else I needed to mention. Can you help me? I can, oh yes, I remember. So it's required by the ABCP 
please type in your name if you are claiming this portion of Perf Web 97. This is the last day for uh, uh, ABCP Category 1 credits. We need to keep a log of that and remember that the evaluation that we have to also have as part of that will be available for up to, one, I think, one hour uh, after the end of the program today. So please click on there and get that evaluation done because I truly want to stay compliant with the ABCP requirements. Uh, because again, for those who can't travel to conferences or just don't have the budget to travel to conferences, whatever the reason is, we want to make sure that we can continue to bring you this online, uh, this online uh, 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 manner of doing that. So, uh, platform, if you will. So, with that said, I'm going to turn this over to Vicki Carlisle. I'm going to bid you all adieu. Vicki, you're going to be on your own. I'm going to go in there and do my case. And uh, I do not believe that case will be done, even though it's not that hard of a case, before you are. So I will uh, uh, wish you good luck, and uh, I will talk to you sometime later this evening. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. All right. Bye, Joe. Okay. Uh, so, yes, the uh, bulk of the lecture today is going to be on hemodynamic disturbances. Uh, it can get a little dense in some spots, and I've kind of broke it down, uh, simplified it as, as much as I could without losing the concept. Uh, so I hope we get through it pretty good time-wise. Okay, uh, so hemodynamic compromise. Uh, I think we all know function of the cardiovascular system. Uh, focus on establishing adequate tissue perfusion. Uh, we're talking about upstream and downstream vessels. With your upstream vessels or your macro circulation being the heart, the vena cava, uh, your pulmonary artery, uh, the aorta, uh, the larger vessels in the central uh, area that provide blood flow, um, they create that pressure gradient through the organs. Uh, most of our hemodynamic numbers that we monitor in the critical care field is going to be uh, reflecting our macro circulatory or our upstream vessels, uh, such as your cardiac output, uh, blood pressure, uh, right atrial pressure. All of those are our are, are, uh, upstream or macro circulation numbers. Um, downstream vessels, of course, are going to be your micro circulation. This is going to be down at your end organ. Uh, tissue perfusion level. Uh, they work at the tissue level and they contribute to the distribution of the blood flow, uh, supplying oxygen, nutrients, removing waste. Uh, and they have perfusion markers that we can uh, kind of uh, follow, uh, things like cap refill time, some lab values, particularly uh, lactic acid. Um, organ function labs, so creatinine, BUN, those type things kind of give us an idea of what our microcirculation is doing uh, as far as uh, perfusion. Um, so uh, reduced tissue perfusion, we're really getting into uh, cellular hypoxia and tissue injury, uh, which really is shock. It's our different shock states. Um, so mainly four broad categories of shock, which we're all very familiar with, which is going to be um, our distributive shock, um, hypovolemic, cardiogenic, and obstructive. Um, distributive shock is our most common shock, uh, most common with sepsis, uh, and it's really characterized by just broad vasodilation, um, SERS response. Uh, you can even have a higher cardiac output state in some of these. Uh, anaphylactic shock, neurogenic shock, uh, and even uh, in endocrine shock. These are all forms of distributive shock. Um, hypovolemic shock. This is really just the volume. So uh, you have a loss of your intravascular volume with a, uh, a high systemic vascular resistance or an SVR as a compensatory mechanism. Uh, we're talking about your hemorrhagic shock, uh, third spacing, especially in like burn victims, um, cirrhosis patients, uh, even overuse of diuretics can put you into a hypovolemic state. 
uh, and, and that's the hypovolemic shock. Um, cardiogenic shock, uh, this is from intracardiac uh, issues uh, that lead to a loss of your cardiac output uh, and uh, leads to systemic hypoperfusion because of a pump failure, more or less. This can be uh, any of your cardiomyopathies, uh, acute MIs, uh, valve problems, uh, pathologies with like the chordae tendinae, septal walls, any of those things that can go wrong inside the heart. Uh, obstructive shock is going to be extra cardiac causes, uh, also leading to decreased cardiac output. Uh, this is going to be things like uh, acute PE or pulmonary hypertension. Uh, both of these things cause impaired blood flow uh, from the right heart to the left heart. Um, can also be things like attention pneumo, um, cardiac tamponade, uh, restrictive or constrictive cardiomyopathies. Um, these are kind of uh, impaired filling situations where uh, the heart isn't able to fill because of obstruction extra cardiac. Um, constrictive pericarditis and restrictive cardiomyopathy um, are both types of uh, diastolic heart failure uh, that prevent filling, one of them because it just can't expand and uh, the other is because the muscles just become really rigid. Um, but both of those are uh, obstructive. Uh, now, when it comes to reduced tissue perfusion, uh, in addition to our overall different groups of shock, I always include fluid overload in there because it is becoming a very well-known cause of reduce, uh, reduced tissue perfusion. Um, regardless of the mechanism of shock, uh, these hemodynamic changes uh, often come before any clinical signs of organ uh, dysfunction from the hypoperfusion, which makes early diagnosis and prompt correction the whole point of monitoring the hemodynamics in the first place to get there before we end up in, a, in severe multi-organ dysfunction. Okay. So this is a, a very uh, nifty depiction here with our normal tissue perfusion here in the middle. Um, we have our inadequate arterial supply on this side, and this is going to be our broad categories of shock. So our obstructive uh, pump failures, the cardiogenic, uh, distributive shock is your vasodilatory shock and your hypovolemic. All of these lead to inadequate organ perfusion or ischemic organ injury. But on the other side, we have the other uh, part, and that is systemic congestion, which also causes that impaired tissue perfusion. Uh, and this is going to be our fluid overload, edema, congestive organ injury. And it can be from pump failure where the heart isn't able to move the volume forward and it backs up. Um, but both lead to this impaired tissue perfusion. Uh, so as a whole, uh, in general, our bodies are very well adapted to handling low volume states. Uh, you know, uh, we've evolved with different compensatory mechanisms to deal with dehydration, um, bleeding, loss of volume. We have a lot of things to kind of help with that but we're poorly equipped to handle high volume states. Our bodies are not as good as managing too much volume. Uh, so it's, it's almost better to leave your patient on the drier side um, where they have more compensatory mechanisms to deal with it. Um, organ perfusion pressure, that's gonna be kind of a concept we need to kind of lay the groundwork for. Uh, and it's gonna be your most relevant macro circulatory uh, parameter uh, that reflects our tissue perfusion. It provides uh, that indirect measurement of blood flow to the organs. Um, and in general, it's influenced by the MAP uh, and your central venous pressure. So kind of your difference between your inflow pressure and your outflow pressure. So uh, your organ perfusion pressure typically you're going to see reduction when you have a low MAP. 
Uh, that's going to be a hypoperfusion state, such as hypovolemic shock. Uh, and an increased uh, CVP or right atrial pressure, you're going to have that systemic congestion. Uh, again, it can be from RV failure or pulmonary hypertension, whatever, but you end up in this same hypoperfusion state. Is Thomas on? Hi, hey, Thomas. Can you hear me? Oh, there he is. I see him. <laughs> Just jump in if you have anything. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Mickey. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I, I made it here on time. <laughs> nice. Okay. Good to see you. Uh, so this one here is another uh, chart that uh, I think is really important uh, just to kind of get the concept down. We have our general broad categories of shock over here, our pump failure, hypovolemia, vasodilation, uh, and then we have our fluid overload with a, a, a type of pump failure over here that leads to the venous congestion. So your right side failure. Uh, and these both feed into this common pathway uh, that goes to organ hypoperfusion, uh, leading to tissue hypoxia. And then you end up here with this endothelial and organ dysfunction. Uh, so this endothelial disruption and the SERS response is the final common pathway for all types of shock, shock irregardless. Uh, so it, it ends up with uh, vasodilation, that SERS response, uh, and organ hypoperfusion. Sometimes it can be difficult to even distinguish between the types of shock if they are past this point here because they all start looking the same, uh, they end up in the same common pathway. Uh, a lot of focus recently uh, on the glycocalyx right here. Uh, it's a uh, carbo uh, carbohydrate rich like um, gel layering on the inside surface of your vessels. It functions as a barrier uh, between the blood and the vessel wall. Uh, and its role is uh, as far as uh, vascular permeability, um, cell adhesion. Uh, it acts as uh, anti-thrombotic, so uh, prevents microclots. It's a sensor for shear stresses as well. So, Things that would increase your shear stresses are going to be blood pressures, uh, rapid volume expansion as with a fluid bolus. Uh, these things add to shear stresses and it, it regulates that by uh, with the control mechanisms with nitric oxide. Um, so when you have glycocalyx damage, uh, you're going to have uh, a lot of uh, leakage from your vessels, uh, a lot of uh, uh, tissue edema, things like that that are going to come up. You're going to have the micro uh, vessel thrombosis, uh, unregulated uh, vasodilation because you now have lost that control mechanism and regulating mechanism with your nitric oxide, um, and also some leukocyte adhesion. These are the things that uh, go wrong when you start having that degradation of your glycocalyx level uh, layer. I'm going to have a picture of it on the next slide here too. It kind of makes it a little bit easier to understand. Um, so hypervolemia is known now to increase glycocalyx degradation, especially with rapid fluid boluses. But other things that break down this, uh, this protective and regulatory glycocalyx uh, is going to be ischemia, uh, reperfusion injuries, hypoxia, uh, sepsis for sure, uh, hemorrhagic shock, uh, hyperglycemia, so high blood sugars for uh, long periods of time has shown breaking down the glycocalyx. Um, bypass surgery, so being on the bypass pump starts the whole Sears response from being on the extracorporeal circuit. And uh, the longer you are on pump, the more degradation of your glycocalyx you'll see which is one of the reasons why patients that are on pump for excessive amounts of time are, are much more prone to having vasoplegia and issues with volume coming off. Um, plasma proteins down here. 
uh, albumin, FFP, and heparin. These are protective uh, aspects to your glycocalyx. They contribute to the maintenance of this vascular integrity of that layer of the glycocalyx, uh, and they help kind of build the structure. They're, they're building blocks of the glycocalyx. Uh, albumin, of course, being a major determinant of the, uh, the plasma osmotic pressure, uh, and it, it, it is a big part of the glycocalyx. Here's an electron micrograph, kind of a cross-sectional of a coronary artery. This entire, all this fuzzy looking layer on the inside, that's your glycocalyx. So it's, it's literally a, a layer covering the entire uh, inside wall. Uh, here is a more uh, cartoonish depiction of it uh, showing how uh, it regulates permeability of the vessel wall. Um, it, uh, you know, regulates that nitric oxide, which is vasodilator. It also plays parts in uh, clotting mechanisms and so forth. Uh, and then this second slide here, you see there's much, uh, much less of your glycocalyx there because it's been sheared off. So now we have loss of that coagulation control. Uh, Antioxidant uh, defense is down. Uh, increased permeability, that's the big one there. Okay. Okay, so recognizing fluid overload. Uh, clinically, fluid overload, uh, we typically think of weight gain, uh, excessively positive fluid balance, especially in a patient that's been getting IV fluids. Um, weight gain, that's a big one. So critical care, we're always doing hourly I's and O's, keeping very tight records on that, daily weights, uh, and things like that. Uh, fluid overload will always have some degree of edema. However, edema does not always equal fluid overload. Uh, so just what we talked about with the glycocalyx, uh, we can kind of understand a little bit how that inflammation response, that breakdown of the glycocalyx starts leading to this vascular permeability. Fluid leaks then from the intravascular space to the extravascular or interstitial space, uh, even if your filling pressures are low. Uh, so you can be hypovolemic with excessive peripheral edema. Uh, so one does not always equal the other. Um, Hypervolemia, of course, being a state of excess blood volume, elevated circulatory filling pressures. Um, edema can be euvolemic, uh, hypervolemic, or it can be hypovolemic. Uh, it's going to show up as pulmonary edema, peripheral edema, interstitial edema, uh, body cavity effusions. So those pleural effusions will start showing up uh, and, and things like that. Um, of course, you can recognize hypervolemia uh, before edema accumulates um, by checking vascular volume. Uh, for example, in the setting of fluid overload, an elevated CVP or uh, right atrial pressure can be detected before you get to the congested organ part of the pathology. So. That's the whole point with our hemodynamic. We're trying to catch it before we get to that part. Um, of course, this can be from disease, um, and it can be a complication of IV fluid therapy that we do in the hospital, fluid boluses, blood product administration, all of that stuff, uh, especially in the setting of some sort of kidney injury. And this chart is just showing that fine balance with our happy spot right here in the middle uh, teetering between low volume and too much volume. Okay, so uh, note on fluid boluses. Uh, in order for a fluid, fluid challenge to be successful, uh, both the right and the left ventricles must be operating on that steep part of your Starling's curve. It's, uh, it's not going to be a successful fluid bolus if only one ventricle is operating in that side of Starling's curve. Uh, they both have to be fluid responsive. 
Uh, you can increase cardiac output by more than 15%, uh, and that's considered a positive fluid bolus. But uh, the whole the whole thing that matters with uh, perfusion and uh, uh, perfusion to the organs and everything is really just oxygen to the tissue, right? So if you think about it, you, you bolus them, whatever crystalloids to get that improvement in cardiac output. Uh, an adult is an average of about five liters or so. Uh, a, liter, a liter bolus uh, causes hemodilution um, and you will decrease your hemoglobin concentration. So one liter for a 15% increase in cardiac output can decrease your hemoglobin concentration by 16%, uh, simultaneous decrease your uh, overall no net change in the actual delivery of oxygen, even though it's a positive fluid challenge. 70% um, of your fluid bolus will just leak into the tissue within 30 minutes because of that endothelial dysfunction um, and the systemic inflammation from the bolus itself. Rapid, especially crystalloids, uh, can cause direct shearing and degradation of that glycocalyx level like we were talking about just a moment ago. Um, so fluid responsiveness does not necessarily equate with fluid requirements. Um, excess volume in the circulation um, can be compensated with your body by redistributing it between stressed volume and unstressed volume uh, and even leaking it into the interstitial space, uh, which we're going to talk about here in a minute, also worsens tissue oxygenation. Um, so you can see over here is just our Starling's curve with a normal ventricle and a failing ventricle uh, fluid responsiveness. I think we've all seen this uh, Starling curves quite a bit. Okay. All right. So in contrast to the arteries, uh, the veins are kind of floppy. Uh, they collapse very easily. They don't hold their shape. Uh, so looking at these as like a cross section of a vein, this one, how it's kind of folded over and in on itself, that's a, that's a, a vein that's not got very much volume in it, uh, and it's even partially collapsing on itself. Uh, they can initially be filled uh, by just changing their shape, uh, the actual uh, Vesu wall is not stretched yet. It's not got any additional tension to it. It's just changing the shape of the vessel itself. Um, and the pressures wouldn't be changed so much until they get past this point here. Um, the volume sitting in these veins um, is the unstressed volume. And it's approximately 60 to 70% of our total blood volume. Uh, and it's really kind of hanging out in the veins. It's holding the vascular wall shape. It's our uh, venous reserve uh, and so forth. Adding more volume to this point here starts you on this stressed volume slope here, where now the vein can take more volume, but in order to take more volume, it has to actually start stretching now. Uh, and stretching adds in a increased pressure. Um, I know, I think Joe actually had this slide as well. Um, but this down here being our unstressed, this is the blood that's just kind of hanging out. Once you get to the stressed volume here, this is the blood that has pressure enough to drive it back to the heart. Um, this is kind of your, uh, your regulated volume. Um, Let's see, this one here is more vasoconstricted. This one's more vasodilated. Uh, so you can see unstressed volume compared to stressed volume here. Um, so once you're filled past a certain volume, the, ch the shape changes uh, and you get that stretch. Uh, the distending pressure uh, starts to increase. And that is the proportion of volume that is now flowing. It's now moving, uh, has enough pressure to be returned to the heart. So I guess my point with this is you have to have some degree of stressed volume. 
Otherwise, your blood is just sitting there with only like muscle contractions and so forth that would push it back. Um, and it's also uh, your effective circulating volume. Okay. Um, vasodilation, especially in those shock states, uh, such as your uh, distributive shock, you end up with this uh, large amount of vasodilation kind of parking all, all your blood in your unstressed volume, reducing your stressed volume here. So now you only have this much mobile blood going back to your heart, and this is going to give you a very hypoperfusion state, uh, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, you can add to the total volume in the system with uh, like creating more stress volume with fluid boluses and so forth. Um, or you can reduce the vessel compliance. That would be a second way to get back this stressed volume. Uh, usually with like vasoconstrictors, repressors and so forth. Uh, and that's really how you would treat uh, distributive shock would be volume boluses and then a, a vasoconstrictor. And that's why, to get back some of this forward flow. Any questions on that, Thomas? Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so for our measurement parameter, uh, we're going to be talking with CVP. Uh, everybody is familiar with this one. This is the pressure from the right atrium um, or the superior vena cava. Um, its hemodynamic usefulness uh, is going to generally reflect right heart function. Um, it's going to give us an idea of your right heart preload. Um, it can help determine fluid status. And I say that with great caution because that has not been uh, proven to be a very accurate marker of actual fluid status in a, in a person at any given time. It can be helpful with trending a number. Uh, it can be helpful in assessing the effectiveness of a fluid challenge, but it, it does not necessarily equate to your fluid volume. It's a reflection of your venous return, and it is a, uh, a large part of your perfusion pressure. Um, so perfusion pr pressure, we talked about that just a little bit, a little bit ago. Uh, that's going to be your MAP minus your CVP. Um, it's going to be how much pressure it takes to push blood through the blood vessels uh, in any given location in your body. Um, so MAP being the driving force from your arterial side uh, with enough force to push through the capillaries. But the CVP is kind of your back pressure to that flow. If you have a good driving pressure, but you have a very high back pressure, your overall result is going to be a decreased perfusion pressure. Um, so they both play a part in that. Um, this is something that was focused on quite a bit when they did all the uh, acute kidney injury trials uh, on how fluid overload can cause kidney injury uh, by reducing how flow can get through the kidneys, just having too much back pressure on that perfusion from the MAP side. Uh, so uh, a lot of study on that recently with the kidneys. Um, intravascular congestion of course, increases that CVP, uh, increasing the backflow. So you're trying to drain into a pipe that's already full. Uh, let's see, uh, large increases in CVP. Uh, this is always gonna be pathologic. So this is a CVP like 25 or 30, not a CVP of eight or nine. When I say large increases in CVP, that's what I mean. And this is always going to be pathologic, like tamponade, an acute PE, uh, right heart dysfunction. All of those give you that good jump in the CVP. Um, CVP, however, is not uh, blood volume. Uh, so again, in resting conditions, uh, uh, about 30% of the blood 
they're about is actually producing that stressed volume um, that we just talked about. And the rest of the blood volume is kind of hanging out, filling out the vessels, holding uh, vessel shape, but doesn't result in any stretch. So that's your unstressed volume. Any change in that ratio can produce changes in your CVP, uh, but not changes in your blood volume. So CVP does not equal blood volume. Uh, any changes downstream, so your microcirculation, um, any changes in your preload, uh, your afterload, cardiac output, uh, any of those things will change your CVP. Um, with your cardiac output not being volume limited, it can be changed according to what our bodies need at the time. Okay. Um, parameters that, uh, that regulate the cardiac output are changing constantly uh, with our own body mechanisms that cause vasoconstriction and dilation and so forth. Okay. Um, BNP, um, this has kind of been a laboratory marker <coughs> that historically has been used to assess uh, for fluid overload, but the greatest value of uh, a BNP result is really the absence of an elevated BNP. Um, because low BNP levels have a high predictive value uh, for ruling out heart failure. So if your BNP is negative, you're probably not in heart failure. That's where its strongest value is, is kind of like the absence of an elevation. On the other hand, high BNP levels are non-specific non really. Uh, they can show up uh, in just an MI, they can show up in uh, a PE, uh, you can see elevated levels of BMP uh, with just renal failure. So also, again, for, for uh, negative BNP is, is uh, a valuable number. Um, CVP waveform here uh, is showing what is happening through the cardiac cycle uh, with your A wave being your atrial contraction, uh, C wave, uh, ventricular contraction, and V wave. Uh, relaxation, those are your upstroke waves with your X and your Y being your downstroke waves. If we have time to get to the waveform analysis, we do go into the different waveforms. Uh, for now, I will not go too deep into it. Okay, so uh, true perfusion pressure to the organ. I know that I have said uh, MAP minus CVP, which is true, but if you get into it just a little deeper, uh, it's rather the precapillary arterial pressure uh, minus the postcapillary pressure, where your MAP up here on general, I don't know, 80, 90, right? A much higher pressure than down here where you're probably more like 35 to 40. But when we're talking about perfusion pressure, we're talking about the pressure that's driving through the, uh, the arterial beds. So it's really going to be this, this precapillary pressure minus your uh, venous pressure on the other side. It makes your pressure gradient much narrower uh, and uh, easier to understand I guess the impact of a high CVP, where if uh, you know your CVP is elevated over here, 18 or 19, it's not going to have as much of effect or reduction if you're really dealing with this 80 or 90, but you're not. It's going to be taking up about half of your true perfusion pressure. Um, this is just showing the, the, the way the pressures are in different parts of the body, starting with your left ventricle having the highest pressure to your aorta. Uh, down to your small arteries, capillaries, then down to the veins, back to the vena cava. Okay. All right, so I am a big fan of uh, point of care ultrasound. Uh, I feel like it's a very useful tool in looking at fluid balance, and we're going to look at some of that. Um, but radiology in general are some of the other ways that we can assess for uh, the volume status of our patient. So chest x-rays, you're going to see dilated upper lobe vessels. Uh, you can see cardiomegaly, interstitial edema, uh, enlarged pulmonary arteries, pleural effusions. 
uh, alveolar edema, uh, prominent upper vessels, and curly lines. We're going to show you all of those. Ultrasound, you're going to see bee lines or comet tails. Uh, you can look at the actual vena cava diameter to see how full it actually is. You can do a, a quick assessment of cardiac function, uh, and you can look at those abdominal veins. In general, you're looking for pumps, pipes, and leaks uh, when you're doing this ultrasound. So the pump, looking how the, the heart is functioning, pipes, how full they are, and leaks if you have any effusions or fluid collections that's uh, leaked out of the vessels. Okay. And the four uh, focused assessments that we're looking at, uh, of course, is going to be our cardiac, vena cava, hepatic vein, and portal vein. Uh, the intrarenal Dopplers, uh, you can look at that as well. It's going to be more of a flow study on that, but for in general, it's just these four. Okay, so this is a good chest x-ray. Okay, um, it's been one of the most used tests to evaluate for hypervolemia in the critical care setting. Um, this one is, uh, you got these clear lungs, right? Both sides are clear. You have normal upper zone vessels. So our, our vessels are normal. They're all going the right way. They're not bulging or enlarged. Um, our heart has got the right ratio to the thoracic width. So we want that to be less than 50%. So the heart less than 50% of your thoracic width. Um, in order for cardiomegaly to show up or an enlarged heart, uh, you, you're going to have a ventricular volume increase of at least 66%. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, of at least 66% before you notice it on the chest x-ray. <coughs> okay. All right, so this one is a not good chest x-ray. Um, first, we're going to look, we can see your cardiac silhouette here to here compared to your thoracic. That is more than 50%, so that is an enlarged cardiac silhouette. Um, you have the upper lobe vessels, how they're dilated out, they're branching out, and they're doing uh, what's called redistributing, um, where you can see them all up here where normally it would be down. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you have airspace shadowing, all this fuzziness in here, uh, the cloudy look. Uh, this is going to be alveolar edema. These uh, little lines on the side are called septal lines or curly lines. Uh, and curly lines is edema in the uh, actual uh, interlobal tissues, your connective tissues, where they're edematous. And you can actually see the, the lines on the chest x-ray. Uh, you can have uh, curly A, B, C, or D. It really just, from my best understanding of it, just matters on which uh, location in the lungs you're seeing these lines. Um, pleural effusions down here at the basis. Uh, you don't have that nice pointy uh, lobe at the bottom. Um, prominent superior vena cava. This is uh, this whole area up here. Um, for chest x-ray, it's hard to differentiate which part is just the vena cava, um, but we call this the vascular pedicle, and it includes what you see in this picture over here. So superior vena cava and your aorta <coughs> make up the vascular pedicle. So if you have a dilated out superior vena cava, it's going to expand your, pel your, your pedicle silhouette, which you can see in this picture down here. Okay. Right here is normal, and then this one is very dilated out, much thicker because that superior vena cava has expanded and is uh, uh, dilated, taking up more space in that silhouette. 
um, a uh, pedicle with a, a width less than 60 millimeters on your uh, chest x-ray is seen as more or less normal fluid status. Um, if it is more than 85 millimeters, then it's considered uh, intravascular volume being too high, uh, at least accurate to 85%. So some of the things you can look at uh, uh, just when they shoot the x-ray at the bedside. Okay. Um, this one is showing the curly lines a little bit closer. That's uh, these little, little marks here. They can be hard to see sometimes. They have them highlighted in this one. I guess that's just septal lines that's holding edema. You can see what they look like here on a chest CT, this uh, honeycombing spider webbing. That's all septal lines. Uh, it just shows up as two-dimensional on the chest x-ray. Um, you can really see the airspace shadowing on this one. Um, this is all that uh, alveolar edema from fluid accumulation. Um, this one down here, you can see different uh, heart enlargements. This one has two lines. You can kind of see like the shadowing effect. Um, this is the double right heart border and what you're actually seeing this inner, this inner line here is a dilated left atrium that's showing through and then a dilated right atrium right on top of it. So it's kind of, you see both outlines. Um, also your carina, uh, is splayed, a uh, splayed carina is where it's really, it's a much wider, uh, it's it's not 90 degrees it's it's really wide because it's a, it's the heart's enlarged so um let's see anything else on here so normally this carina would come down more like this where this one is is wide this one is more narrow uh, and that's just called a, a splayed carina um, I think that's it on this one. Okay. Okay, uh, this is a bedside ultrasound here. Let's see. Let's play it here. Okay, so A lines. Uh, on this one, this is our normal ultrasound of the lung. And you have these horizontal lines called A lines, uh, and they are normal. Uh, it's just kind of artifact from different air areas in the lung. This one over here, however, has B lines. That's these uh, lines that go all the way to the edge of the field. You have multiple of them. They move with your respiratory your breathing effort, you can see it's kind of sliding with the lungs. This up here is your pleural line. So it, 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 is, it is seen all the way through the lung field from the pleural line all the way to the edge of your field. <clears throat> and this is showing us that we have a lot of um, uh, extravascular lung water. Uh, and it kind of reflects back from your ultrasound probe causing these, uh, these B lines, also called comet tails. Now you need to have at least two to three of those. This is uh, like in between two ribs here. So you would have to have at least two or three of those for it to be diffuse edema. Uh, and typically you're wanting it to be in, in more than two zones. Uh, it can also be seen in pneumonia or ARDS patients. Uh, and again, because it's just picking up all that extra fluid. So again, something you can do real quick at the bedside and kind of assess how your fluid volume is in the lungs. <clears throat> uh, this again is ultrasound as well. Um, this is pleural effusion. So uh, pleural wall here, this is going to be our lung here. This is a separation between the two that is just fluid. It's fluid held in between. Um, and this is just a different angle of it showing the fluid. <clears throat> I think this is called the quad sign or something like that, where you can see all these angles line up. 
kind of boxing in the fluid. Okay. All right, so this one is going to show us our inferior vena cava. Uh, this is our hepatic veins here, right and left hepatic vein, uh, right atrium is right here, and vena cava here, blood coming back this way, along with the cardiac cycle down here so you, you can see it. So normal diameter of the vena cava, uh, taken approximately one to two centimeters below the atrium is where they're going to measure it from. Um, normal is 1.5 uh, to 2.5 centimeters. Um, and of course, anything less than 1.5 centimeters is going to be considered volume depleted. Anything more than 2.5 centimeters is going to be more suggested of volume overload. Um, normal respiratory cycle, you want to see some collapsibility in your vena cava of at least 50% is normal. Uh, as long as you're not fluid overloaded or too depleted, you're going to take a breath in and your vena cava collapses or compresses up to 50%. So this is on exhalation. This is when this patient takes a breath in. You can see it is much smaller diameter here than it is here. I would say it definitely is compressing more than 50%. So this is a normal looking vena cava as far as, far as volume goes. Okay. <clears throat> okay. All right. So this one, uh, we have our vena cava here. And you can see it kind of breaking through a little bit up here, flowing this way. Uh, this is our right hepatic vein and our left hepatic vein. And this one is pretty dilated out. It's, uh, it's giving us what's called the bunny sign because it looks like the Playboy bunny. Um, and it is, it is basically showing you that you're having some venous congestion here in your hepatic veins. And the vena cava itself is dilated. Um, this is one of the... Uh, Vexus scores. If you're doing these point of cares, those four markers that you're looking at to assess fluid overload, being the heart, the uh, hepatics, uh, and so forth, vena cava, this is one of them. Um, and it gives you like a Vexus score. I'll show you that here in just a moment. Um, but it can kind of grade the degree of fluid overload that you have. Okay. I think this one doesn't actually play. I know I, know I have another video coming up. Oh, okay. Here's the Vexus score here I was just talking about. Um, so step one is your vena cava greater than two centimeters. If it is, you move to step two. Step two is your hepatic vein. Um, and it has different waveforms depending on how much fluid it has in it. This is a normal one here. Uh, so this would be what it looked like in real life. This is like a cartoon depiction of it. And then this would be severely abnormal, where you have really high pressures in your systolic and diastolic, um, very specific to fluid overload in that hepatic vein. Uh, step three is going to be your portal vein. So normally it has very kind of laminar flow through there. So this one you can see here in real life, that's what a normal flow through there would look like. Um, severely abnormal if you have a much higher pulsatility index. So you can see all, all this upstrokes here, uh, very diagnostic for fluid overload. So this one would be what it would look like there. Uh, on your renal veins, uh, same thing. You can have mostly in a normal, a monophasic flow, uh, which you can see down here uh, in real life. And then, excuse me, in your fluid overload, you're going to see your uh, diastolic hump down here with very sharp peaks. The middle one, you can actually see systolic and diastolic, but I didn't include that one on this side. You just see normal and abnormal. And so these are the parameters would give you uh, a score of fluid overload. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so a pl uh, plethoric IVC, this is a 
uh, dilated out vena cava that is not compressible. So this first one, and again, very easy and quick to do this at the bedside. Uh, this one, come back. Uh, this one is collapsing with respiration. See right here? This one's okay. This is a good vena cava. It's collapsing like it should with respiration. This is your right atrium down here. Uh, this one, however, it's dilated and there's no compression with respiration. This is a plethoric IVC or an engorged IVC. Um, and it has very minimal respiratory variation. Um, this is showing us that we're dealing with some high filling pressures uh, and it's very good evidence for fluid overload. Okay, um, so management of hypervolemia, um, diuretic therapy, so bolus or using continuous infusion. Um, they've studied this uh, infusion versus bolus, all-cause mortality, length of stay, uh, urine output if measured in a 24-hour period, um, and incidence of hypokalemia, changes in BNP, no real changes between bolus and continuous infusion. The continuous infusion did have a reduction in body weight that was greater uh, in that continuous infusion versus the bolus. Um, other than that, no significant changes between the two. Uh, goal urine output was three to four milliliters per kilogram per hour. Um, and that is generally well tolerated. Uh, it rarely causes an intravascular volume depletion uh, that is faster than what your capillary refill time would be. Uh, so that's generally what we're going for, where you can diurese out without sending them into hypovolemic shock um, from them not being able to refill that vascular space from their tissue fast as it is being diuresed out. Um, so for most patients, that's well tolerated. Another parameter uh, would be 200 mils in two hours for a positive Lasix challenge. Um, of course, hypotension, fluid and electrolyte depletion, and acute renal failure is what we're, we're risking here. Um, so despite, despite diuretics being associated with causing acute kidney injury, uh, more aggressive use of especially loop diuretics to get rid of that excess volume is still associated with improved outcomes despite the increased risk of a kidney injury. Um, I do want to stress, though, that diuretics are not uh, preventative. Like if you have a patient that's losing their urine output and, you know, you hear somebody, oh, well, let's ki kickstart the kidneys, let's give them some Lasix. Um, diuretics are ineffective in the prevention or the treatment of acute kidney injury and can even make it worse. Uh, they do not shorten the duration of an acute kidney injury, um, and diuretics will not reduce the need for eventual dialysis or CRT. They do play an important role in the management of the volume, however, um, and that's where I am talking about the use. Not recommended in the prevention of an acute kidney injury. It won't do it. Okay, so uh, once you're past the effectiveness of your diuretics, you are moving on to uh, extracorporeal therapies. So uh, intermittent hemodialysis versus continuous renal replacement. Um, with your CRT, of course, being a slower fluid removal over your intermittent hemodialysis, uh, Typically, you will get a lot more hemodynamic stability with CRT, especially in these patients that are on uh, shock states. Uh, they're usually unstable, multiple pressors and so forth, and they, they won't tolerate that aggressive intermittent hemodialysis. And so you'll start on more of a slower therapy CRT. Um, it, it provides like a slower control of your fluid removal your solutes. It avoids those large fluctuations, uh, especially with uh, patients that are at risk for cerebral edema. 
Um, the modes that you're going to see, um, CVVH is your uh, hemofiltration uh, or your convection modes with scuff being a baby version of CVVH. Um, your CVVHD is going to be your diffusion mode. Uh, so your classic dialysis with dialysate on one side of the membrane and blood on the other with SLED being your baby version of that. Uh, and then CVVHDF being a combination of convection mode and diffusion mode, uh, most aggressive uh, mode there. And it's good for those higher inflammatory markers, cytokines, things like that with those more aggressive uh, convection modes are pretty helpful, especially with sepsis. Um, when to start CRT or dialysis, uh, this of course is up to physician preference, but there's generally accepted, uh, indications. So refractory to medical management, uh, that's going to be your acid base imbalance, your electrolyte disturbances, uh, volume overload with symptoms of congestion your metabolic acidosis, refractory to your medical management, severe electrolyte derangement, um, uremic complications. So high levels of uremia in your blood can cause pericarditis. It's associated with uremic bleeding, uh, things like that. So if you start seeing those uremic complications, that's an immediate need for dialysis, uh, drug toxicities, um, ICP issues not compatible with intermittent HD. So patients that are at risk for cerebral edema, stroke patients, and so forth, any of those guys really shouldn't be on regular HD because those fluid shifts can cause cerebral edema. Um, so this, this graph over here is showing kind of uh, how they're interchangeable. So CRT and intermittent HD are really complementary therapies, right? Uh, you can start out very unstable and progress to more stable and be on intermittent HD and decline back and, and kind of <coughs> move between the two modes as is uh, clinically appropriate uh, with the patient's hemodynamic status. Uh, and that's all this one is showing here. <coughs> oh, sorry. Okay. okay, so now we're moving on to uh, the cardiogenic dysfunction. Um, this is going to be your intracardiac causes uh, that result in a decreased cardiac output and systemic hypoperfusion cardiomyopathies, acute MI, postcardiotomy, arrhythmias, mechanical. Uh, I think we all are pretty familiar with the causes of cardiogenic shock, 79% um, being left ventricular failure. Um, so arrhythmias, maybe one that's not as familiar, but arrhythmias, both tachy and brady arrhythmias can send you into cardiogenic shock. Okay. Um, any kind of issues with your papillary muscles, your cordi tendini, uh, long bypass time. Uh, so the longer you're on pump, the more likely you are to have that SERS response. Okay, okay. so recognizing cardiogenic shock. Uh, again, this uh, probably isn't going to be anything super shocking to anyone here. Um, but presenting symptoms of cardiogenic shock, shock uh, are uh, like patient history, labs, EKG. You can do that point of care bedside ultrasound to kind of look at the heart function, um, signs of congestion, so JVD rails, pulmonary edema, uh, congestion in the liver, um, low perfusion. So this is going to be kind of like right side, left side failure here. Um, yeah, congestion, uh, peripheral edema, JVD, this is going to be right failure here. Hypoperfusion, cool, poorly perfused, modeling, all of that is going to be your left. Okay, uh, any shock, 
hypotension, altered mental status, loss of urine output, cold, clammy skin, that can be a shared symptom of any shock. Okay, so this is going to be uh, some 12 lead EKGs kind of showing uh, right versus left. So this top one here is an inferior STEMI, and you can see in leads 2, 3, uh, and AVF, uh, some pretty significant ST elevation. This is going to be uh, right coronary artery in 80% of the cases. It can be your dominant left circumflex artery in about 18%. Um, so right side here, um, this bottom one is showing an anterior STEMI uh, with ST elevation in V2, V3, uh, and some in V4. This is going to be your LAD. Okay. Um, of course, different treatments could be needed for the different kinds. So knowing which one you're in is uh, is important. Okay, here's a, a little diagram showing our coronaries. Um, your left main up here traditionally becomes your left circumflex and your LAD. Uh, the ramus is uh, not as common. Only about 15% of our, our patients have a ramus. Um, with the other 85, 90% just having left circumflex and the LAD. Um, heart dominance is another thing that we need to have in mind. Uh, and it's really just which coronary branch uh, gives off the PDA. So if your PDA comes off the right side, you are an RPDA for right side dominant heart, um, as opposed to a left side where you're an LPDA. Um, Codominant is not as, as common. Okay. All right, so some of your views for your point of care ultrasound. Uh, I always start with this view up here, your parasternal long axis view or your plaques. Um, it gives me a, a pretty good look at the chambers and how I'm most comfortable kind of looking at uh, the function, the wall motion, and things like that. I'm going to show you a couple videos of that. That being said, you're supposed to evaluate it from four different angles because sometimes it's not as apparent if you're just looking at one aspect. Uh, but this is always where I start. I'm most comfortable looking at that one. Um, so yeah, parasternal long axis. Uh, this one is really good at showing your right ventricle, your left ventricle, um, your left atrium, your left ventricular outflow tract coming out the aorta right here. Um, you can see if you have some dysfunction pretty good on your left ventricle. You can see if there's any pericardial effusions. Um, you can't really see it on this one, but uh, on the one here in a minute, you're going to see it better. But you can gauge that by looking at where your descending aorta is at. Um, over here, the second one is our parasternal short axis view. Um, it's just a different angle, looking at the walls from a different perspective. You can see, again, right ventricular function, left ventricular. You can see your intraventricular septum pretty good in this view. Um, so looking again at dysfunction, septal flattening, RV dysfunction, and you can also see pericardial effusions pretty good. Um, apical four chamber view. Uh, is again just one of those additional uh, angles to view and it gives you like a more of a direct side-by-side -side comparison of your right and left heart so it's it's good for assessing if you're having an abnormal dilation <clears throat> so particularly useful in looking at RV failure you can see pericardial effusions in this one you can also see the valves function really well in this view um, sub subzifoid uh, I have trouble even finding this view very often. I'm just not very good at finding it, but it is one of the other views. Um, and then, of course, this is your right atrium and your IVC here. So kind of checking again for that volume load. Okay. Uh, and the green arrows are just kind of showing which direction you're pointing your probe. Okay, so this is going to be your parasternal long axis.
And this is a good looking functioning heart. I would call this one a normal EF. So what we're looking at, uh, first of all, our mitral valve here, we want that to come and almost just slap that septal wall. That's what we want that to look like. So you can see it is coming and it is touching that septal wall in the middle. That's a good sign. You want to see this muscle down here getting thicker and thinner, which you do. It's getting thicker and thinner. Your actual chamber size is getting smaller and larger, meaning you are uh, getting rid of a good stroke volume. So even without doing the actual measurements, I can see it's doing good here, right? Good function. Um, right here is your descending aorta. So this is how I would use the descending or aorta. If you see a fluid accumulation, let's say it's up here. There's like a fluid accumulation because it is inside of this descending aorta. I know that it's a pericardial. If it's out here, outside of the descending aorta, then it's more of a, a lung, like a pleural effusion. Okay, so normal, uh, normal bedside echo here without any measurements. Uh, you can estimate. Uh, just the more you do it, the more experience you have with it. You can kind of tell over time which ones are normal and which ones are not. You could even get to where you can give a pretty good guess at an EF. This one is probably a normal EF. Okay. Here is a not normal EF. So you can see our little mitral valve is barely opening, barely moving. It's definitely not coming close to our septal wall here. Our cardiac muscle, the myocardium itself, is really not changing in thickness. Um, and most importantly, our chamber size is not getting smaller. So it's dilated out, and we're not getting rid of any stroke volume. We do see our aortic valve right here is opening, um, and maybe a little dilation on our left atrium. So this is a severely reduced EF. Um, if you could see further down here to the apex to see how much it's moving, it would give you a better estimate as well. Uh, lack of movement down on the apex could mean a loss of as much as 15% of your EF, but I would call this one severely reduced EF, 20% or less. Okay, okay this one uh, is also very interesting because the different colors coordinate with where the different coronary arteries are. So like the green, if you see the wall motion abnormal here, that would mean uh, probably uh, an issue with your RCA or your circumflex. Uh, up here, if this wall is having trouble moving, that's going to be LAD. Uh, RCA up here, this top part's in your right side heart and so forth. So the, it kind of it's interesting to see uh, which artery may be affected by looking at the wall motion on your point of care ultrasound. Um, and that's true with all of them, just showing different perspectives of it down here as well. So this purple area, your septal wall, RCA, or LAD, depending on which artery is perfusing which section. How are we doing on time magic? Okay, all right. I was worried about that. All right, so management of cardiogenic shock. Early revascularization is our most important treatment strategy in cardiogenic shock that's due to an acute MI. Um, so we do that via PCI or cabbage. We reestablish perfusion to those areas. Um, hemodynamic support. Uh, so uh, we're talking preload optimization, uh, pressors and inotropes. And of course, mechanical support if all of those fail. Uh, this is uh, that spiral that if not interrupted leads to death down here. Um, so heart injury leads to loss of cardiac output, loss of stroke volume leads to hypotension. Hypotension leads to systemic perfusion loss, uh, leads to end organ dysfunction, which leads to inflammation. Remember, all states of, so of shock, regardless, always end up in this, uh, this dilation phase down here. Um, 
and it keeps going around. So viol- uh, vasodilatory loss of SVR, loss of more cor- uh, cor- coronary perfusion, uh, worsening uh, heart function, and so on. Um, PCI, in addition, can also be like your clot-busting drugs, so your, uh, your TPA. Um, you also can put them on heparin. They're probably going to be on some aspirin Plavix after they get their stints. Uh, you can use inotropes for your uh, improved contractility, so dibutamine, dopamine, uh, norepinephrine. Uh, nitroglycerin it can relax and widen your blood vessels, so it kind of parks excess fluids. Kind of helpful if you have uh, right heart failure. Okay. Um, fluids are good to give in these patients if they're hypotensive and there is no pulmonary edema present. You can do fluid challenges. Um, this one is showing us those signs and symptoms again. So right heart versus left heart and then your shared findings. I think everybody knows those. Okay, so right heart failure. Um, our first step is going to be preload optimization. So is this a right heart issue that a higher preload would help? Um, So the right heart has a much flatter uh, Starling's curve than the left ventricle. So uh, RV contractility changes less over a wide range of filling pressures than the left. So in conditions where the right ventricle output is impaired due to contractility issues, but the afterload is normal. So you don't have high pulmonary pressures, uh, but you are still having impaired heart function. Uh, So this is going to be just a straight up right heart MI. Uh, A higher preload is needed with these patients. These are the ones that you want to ride with a high CVP. Um, Not any afterload problems. Okay. However, the majority of right heart failure are conditions that are due to a high afterload to the right heart. So an acute P, uh, acute PE, pulmonary hypertension, ARDS, uh, these scenarios, you want to reduce excessive right heart preload. Um, so diurese these patients, uh, reduce how much workload and di- dilation that right chamber is having because dilating it out, you're going to worsen uh, the ischemia. So actually, reducing their fluid can improve contractility versus the other right heart that you want to ride high. Um, Afterload reduction is going to be our second step. step. So general measures in afterload reduction, um, correcting your acidosis, your hypoxia, uh, your high CO2 levels, all of those states cause vasoconstriction in in your pulmonary bed. Uh, increasing your afterload, putting more work onto the right side. Um, Lung protective ventilation, so using the lowest effective plateau pressures, Um, lower tidal volumes, avoid super high peeps, uh, but make sure you're avoiding hypoxia and high CO2. Medications that are afterload reduction, it's going to be your nitric oxide, your epoprostenol, uh, which flow land, um, or your phosphodiesterase inhibitors, all of those kind of dilate the pulmonary bed, Um, improving contractility. So first step there is maintaining good perfusion to the right heart, preventing that overstretching uh, the dilation of your right ventricle, Um, maintaining normal sinus rhythm. So uh, avoiding uh, super tacky SVT rhythms and things like that can worsen cardiac function. And then inotropes. Uh, So dibutamine is uh, what's called an inodilator. It's an inotrope that improves uh, contractility, but it's also good at giving some degree of vasodilation. Um, So it's good to improve contractility in normal tensive patients, not necessarily hypotensive. Uh, Dopamine, it increases your cardiac output, but it, uh, it doesn't really increase your pulmonary vascular resistance too much. So that's a good one for a patient that's having low blood pressure issues, uh, but not so great if you're already having tachycardia uh, or rhythm issues. Uh, Milrinone is a selective phosphodiesterase inhibitor. Uh, It improves 
cardiac output and inotropy. It also dilates the pulmonary bed. So it's a very good one for pulmonary hypertensive patients that have gone into right heart failure. Um, it commonly has to be paired with like Levo or something because it can cause actually uh, systemic blood pressure to drop. Epinephrine, uh, shown to improve cardiac output without hugely affecting your PBR. Um, normal uh, norepinephrine, norepinephrine um, is also good if you have a patient that's hypotensive. Vasopressin uh, binds to its own receptors, to the V1 receptors in the vascular smooth muscles. Um, at low doses, it can actually dilate the pulmonary uh, by its effects with nitric oxide. Um, higher doses, however, can cause coronary con uh, vasoconstriction. So uh, lower doses, usually it's a flat rate. Um, mechanical support would be our last, uh, our last step there. It's bridge to recovery or to a definitive treatment. Uh, so ECMO, it can give you right to left circulatory support by unloading the right side of the heart and returning it to the aorta. Um, right ventricular assist devices like your Impella RP um, actually threads up into the pulmonary artery and gives uh, a lot of support to the right side there. Um, Protect Duo can and Centromag can offer some right ventricular support if it's put in in the right atrial and pulmonary artery configuration. Uh, this is just a chart, uh, chart showing the different uh, ventricular assist devices uh, with your RP over here, uh, your VA ECMO here, Centromag, uh, and so forth. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Is there a loss of endothelial tissue directly related to length of time? Yes, yes. So the longer that you're on pump, the more of that systemic inflammatory response is triggered by being in contact with that extracorporeal uh, circuit. The longer you have that inflammation response, the more of your glycocalyx is sheared away. Um, and long-term long bypass patients can be difficult to wean off of bypass. A lot of times they'll come off in a vasoplegia state, which we're getting ready to talk about right now. Um, and long-term ECMO, uh, yes, you also get that effect, ex especially with ECMO. When you first go on ECMO, you get a, a very profound vasodilation effect. Uh, and over time, you do see, uh, especially things like loss of platelets and things get tore up and, and uh, used up in the circuit. Um, you are always fighting that inflammatory response anytime you're in touch with that extracorporeal circuit. Uh, so yes, yes, definitely. Um, vasoplegia is going to be the consequence of that, actually. So uh, vasoplegia is a persistent low SVR, so your systemic vascular resistance. Uh, this is going to be in response to cardiac failure, sepsis, anaphylaxis, hemorrhage, and surgery. Um, it's a vasodilatory shock, uh, and it's... Uh, most known by a profound, uncontrollable vasodilation due to that low SVR. It can have a normal or even a high cardiac output because uh, SVR and cardiac output are opposite of each other. If you have less resistance in the circulatory system, then there's no resistance to your cardiac output and it, it can be elevated. Um, it is a complication of cardiac surgery in up to 25% of the patients. Um, and again, the longer you're on pump, the more likely you are to get this, uh, this issue. Uh, most commonly, however, you're gonna see vasoplegia in your septic shock patients. Um, can also be very common in pancreatitis. Um, yeah, I think, I think pancreatitis and some somewhat in cirrhosis, uh, not because of a, uh, uh, inflammatory response with cirrhosis, but because they have a lot of the same pathologies on the vessel wall. So in stage cirrhosis patients are chronic low SVR. 
um, pathophysiology. So uh, without getting too crazy, because this is a, uh, a lot of pathways and steps and a lot of different mechanisms that can cause vasoplegia, um, I'm not sure that I would even be able to understand and explain them all, but the uh, dysregulation of nitric oxide release, nitric oxide production, and nitric oxide signaling is considered to be our main culprit here. Um, and of course, it's a signaling molecule, a gaseous signaling molecule that's in charge of vasoconstriction and vasodilation. Also thought to be involved in these pathways is going to be your adenosine, prostanoids, endotheliums, your RAS system, hydrogen sulfide, and an overall vasopressin deficiency. Okay. Um, so it's uh, the more you look into this, the more this leads to this this triggers this and it's a, it gets to be a very complicated pathway but uh, it is generally agreed upon nitric oxide issues are at the center of it and it is the target of ma majority of our treatments is targeting the nitric oxide pathway okay um, catecholamine resistant vasoplegia is going to be our worst scenario outcomes are 25 percent mortality rates on these uh, you can run pressors and there's just no uh, response to it. You, you have a very, very hard time getting a blood pressure on these guys because it, it just doesn't matter what presser you give them. They're not getting any vasoconstriction. And uh, that's definitely the worst kind. Okay. So this was the simplest chart that I could find of the different pathways uh, that lead to vasoplegia. Uh, and I am going to focus on these right here because both of these uh, target specifically our nitric oxide uh, sites. So uh, the red lines, of course, are going to be uh, showing us inhibition. Uh, green arrows are showing stimulation. So if you don't inhibit the nitric oxide here, it continues down the various pathways to create more vasoplegia. Um, same with vasopressin deficiency and your potassium dependent a ATP channels. Uh, it gets very complicated. This is a very simplified chart. Um, so this is your nitric oxi oxide synthase. Uh, and that is thought in the inflammatory process to be stimulated in overproduction of nitric oxide, which of course causes a lot of vasodilation, inappropriate vasodilation. And if it's right on the vascular wall, then you have vasoplegia. Okay, the increased levels of the uh, inducible nitric oxide synthase is directly proportional to the total time on cardiopulmonary bypass just to kind of reinforce your question on that. So time on the pump is a big deal. Uh, we always chart our cross clamp time and our pump time and nobody wants the patient that's been over there for six hours. <laughs> that one's gonna be a tough patient. Okay. Um, downstream effects of these increased levels of nitric oxid, uh, oxide, of course, is gonna be that vasoplegia um, and prolonged shock. Uh, it reduced outcomes, long ICU stays, and so forth. Um, actually, uh, vasopressin stimulation is, is found to be uh, reduced in bypass patients, even more so than the septic patients. So this is another thing that would make that worse. Uh, and vasopressin, of course, normally causes vasoconstriction, uh, and it also modulates this potassium-dependent ATP channel, um, and it makes it so that your vasoconstrictors work better. Um, so your catecholamines will have a greater response if you are not vasopressin deficient. Okay, that's all those downstream effects. And that's about as deep as I can go into that pathway. Okay, here is our treatments. Um, vasopressors are gonna be our first line. 
uh, for vasoplegia after a fluid challenge, uh, depending on if it was successful or not. So your catecholamines, norepinephrine, epi, uh, neo are all commonly used. Uh, Levo, of course, having alpha-1 and beta-1. Uh, epi is alpha, beta, and beta-2. Uh, neo is just alpha-1. Um, so it, it's just vasoconstriction without any um, inotropic support at all. Um, for catecholamine-resistant vasoplegia, uh, we typically move to vasopressin because it doesn't use the same receptor sites as the catecholamines. It has its own vasopressin receptor sites, uh, and it can help uh, get some vascular tone back. Um, of course, if you end up on those higher doses of vasopressin, you're going to end up with that uh, bad perfusion to the gut with uh, vasopressin being the very worst at causing gut ischemia. Um, also is associated with some renal issues for uh, perfusion issues to the kidneys. Uh, angiotensin II uh, is, a, is a newer one, and it's, of course, uh, one of the main components of your RAS system. Um, it acts on angiotensin type 1 receptors to cause direct vasoconstriction. Uh, um, it can activate your sympathetic nervous system, uh, secretes aldosterone, renal, uh, renal sodium channels, all of that. It's all part of that kidney RAS system. Um, corticosteroids. Uh, this is used with the vasodilatory shock with the like assumption that they have depleted some of their adrenal axis. Uh, the adrenal axis is made of like your hypothalamus, your pituitary uh, gland, and your adrenal glands, and they work to balance like the hormones, the stress hormones, and so forth. So corticosteroids are aimed at restoring those levels so that you can regulate your own stress response and help. Um, it, of course, uh, makes your sugars high, so it can... Uh, make glucose levels hard to control. You can have delayed wound healing with these. Uh, we typically don't want them on for very long. Um, probably the one that everyone sees most often for treating vasoplegia is going to be the methylene blue. Um, this inhibits that nitric oxide, in, uh, oxide synthase. So really it's decreasing how much nitric oxide is produced in the first place. Um, it's capable of binding to nitric oxide, uh, basically reducing the level of free nitric oxide in the system. Um, hydroxycobalamin, this is a very high dose vitamin B12. Uh, you guys may know it as the cyanopack. It was traditionally used for cyanide poisoning. Uh, and it again acts on your nitric oxide. It acts like a sinkhole to nitric oxygen, uh, nitric oxide. Um, by it binds it with the cobalt uh, in your cobalamin has this cobalt here, and it will make a complex with nitric oxide and cobalt, uh, basically taking up your nitric oxide. Okay. Yes. Uh, so the identifier is you're getting no response from your catecholamines. You're, uh, you're maxing out on your catecholamines, uh, and you're still having very, very low SBR, difficult time getting a blood pressure. Perfusion is a real risk. Uh, and yeah, you would move on to the angiotensin then kind of like a step-by-step -step process. We're going to start here. If that doesn't work, we're going to go to the next aggressive level and the next aggressive level. Um, at one of the facilities I work in, I feel like just about every patient gets a dose of methylene blue. Uh, probably not every patient, but that's definitely the first go-to at that facility, um, even sometimes before they're on pressors. Uh, angiotensin II very rarely... Um, only used that a handful of times, and it was in that catecholamine-resistant vasoplegia syndrome. It's uh, very aggressive. Okay. All right. I, we made it through. Uh, what, how's our time?
Okay. So I don't think because we're already coming up on about two hours, I don't think we're going to have time to get through the waveforms. I'm going to bunt this to our next perf web. We'll go through all of our waveform analysis on that one. So otherwise we'll end up at like three hours. <laughs> That's another hour and a half there. Sorry. Any questions? Any input, comments? Yes, I have seen, and that is, uh, it used to be generally thought that true vasoplegia happened acutely while you were on pump, and they would just draw it up in the syringe and push it. There was uh, not necessarily a recommended dose. It was give it until you get a blood pressure kind of situation where in the ICU, more on the critical care side, they mix it into like a piggyback and it's given much slower than what they do in the, in the OR. But yes, yes, I've seen that. And I've seen them do that with your uh, hydroxycobalamine as well. And I feel like you get a much quicker reaction with the hydro hydroxycobalamine. Um, its biggest side effect is hypertension. So it literally is the, directly reverses uh, vasoplegia. And I, I feel like it is more effective than the methylene blue, but uh, I don't see it used very often. Most of the hospitals usually only keep like one or two cyano packs in the whole facility anyway for cyanide poison patients. Uh, so not as common. And it makes your urine really red because it has that chromo color. So if your patient's on dialysis and you give them the hydroxycobalamin, you're going to get like blood leak detector alarms and so forth. Just something to keep in mind. Uh, with methylene blue, when you're pushing it in the vials in the OR like that, it will drop your SATs, but it's not a real drop in SAT. It just reads that way. Uh, but if you were to check a blood gas, you would have normal oxygen levels, but your pulse ox is going to be reading 20, 30% because it affects how that reads through your actual pulse ox. And it usually lasts uh, maybe 10 minutes before it, it comes back. <laughs> So I have had, I've had NPs and critical care doctors have heart attacks in the ICU when they seen the saturations drop to 40 uh, and you just have to kind of like let them know this is not real. It's from your methylene blue. It'll pass. Um, I've had lab call me wondering why my serum is blue. Um, so yeah, it's kind of fun if you, if you've given it enough and you know what's going to happen, but they don't, it can be interesting. That's it. Okay. So we'll do the waveform analysis on the next perf web sessions because I don't want to run us over too long. I knew this would be a longer lecture. Um, so yeah. Do we have any announcements I need to give? Perf web 98. Uh, oh yeah. I see the dates. March 18, 19, 20 and 21st is going to be Perf web 98. That's going to be the four day. I can't really read the topics. It's too small, but we, we will have the hemodynamic, uh, hemodynamic waveform analysis will be one of them. Um, I see ECLS adverse effects. It's too small for me to read the rest of them, <laughs> but they'll be posted up there. Won't they David? They'll be posted under PerfWeb90. You'll be able to see the topics. PerfWeb.us. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks for sticking in there.